I'm John McQuay with 8541 Tactical, and this is Mail Call Mondays, the show that answers your questions about precision rifles, optics, and equipment. Well, thank you for joining us on our post-Easter Monday. We've got some questions to get into here, and then we'll talk about some things that we got coming up on future projects. Our first question for today is off of YouTube. Rapala135 asks, Can you explain the difference between first and second focal plane scopes? Thanks. Well, Rapala, the difference between a second focal plane scope and a first focal plane scope is fairly simple to describe. It's a little bit harder to get a mental grasp on. On a first focal plane scope, the reticle covers the same amount of the target no matter what your power setting is at. So if you set a scope, a first focal plane scope, to the lowest power setting, you look through it at a target, and then you turn the power up. If the target appears to be 2 mils wide at 3 power, it's still going to appear to be 2 mils wide at 10 power or 20 power or whatever the maximum power of the scope. If you look through a second focal plane scope, and let's say at it's mil correct at 20 power, if you look through the scope at 10 power, a 2 mil wide target is actually going to appear to be 1 mil wide. When you crank it up to 20 power, then that 2 mil target will appear to be 2 mil wide. So the reticle in the scope will stay the same size no matter what the magnification setting is, even though the target will appear to grow in size. It's kind of confusing at first, but once you start working with the scopes, it's pretty easy to identify. Now, that's the physical difference between the two. Now, how you use the two are quite different. Um, second focal plane scopes were the standard for a very long time. Uh, most of the variable power scopes were second focal plane scopes, and they had a mil correct power. If you looked in the owner's manual or somewhere marked on the scope, it would tell you what power the reticle was correct at. If you were at any other power, you had to apply a correction factor in your head. On first focal plane scopes, there isn't any of that because it's correct at every power setting. Now the advantage of a first focal plane scope, since it's correct at all power settings, you don't have to make sure that for a certain operation the scope is set on a certain power. Now I hear guys argue all the time that it's for ranging. It's not for ranging. Uh, first focal plane scopes really aren't any greater advantage for range estimation than a second focal plane scope. The reason being, when you're doing range estimation, you want the scope on the highest power so that you can get the greatest breakdown of that mill reticle. You don't want to try to range something at three power on a first focal plane scope just because you can. You're going to have trouble breaking that reticle down into tenths or half tenths. That's what you need to be able to accurately range an object with a rifle scope. Now on a second focal plane scope, I'm going to have that thing cranked up at maximum anyway. So unless it's one of the oddball scopes that doesn't have a mil correct reticle at the highest power, you're going to be fine. Most of them do. Most that are out there are mil correct at the highest power. So it's a wash for range estimation. Where the first focal plane reticle really comes into play is if you're shooting at less than maximum magnification on your rifle scope. Very frequently when we engage moving targets or snap targets that are going to come up where we don't know exactly what position on the range, you want to dial that scope magnification down so you have a very wide field of view. When you do that on a first focal plane scope, you know your leads and your holds are still going to be correct in the reticle. Now with a second focal plane scope, if it's mil correct at 20 power and you dial it down now and you've got to get it down to 10 power to get your widest field of view, then you're going to have to apply a correction factor to all of your leads and all of your holds. It's another step that you're going to have to go through in your mind before you press the trigger. It's fine to do that on a, a nice calm day at the range where you're just shooting with your buddies, just doing some plinking, uh, you have all the time in the world to get it correct in your head, know what you're doing. Um, when you go either in real life 
or if you go out to competitions where there's now a time limit and there's pressure on you to make the shot, it's very easy to forget what your correction factor is or goof it up or not have your scope set on exactly the right power setting. Um, if you haven't gone out and actually tested your scope, you may think that putting it at the 10 on the power selector ring is actually 10 power, and it may not be. It may be 9.5, it may be 10.5. You don't know unless you've actually gone out, tested it, and then marked it on that ring exactly where that power is. So if you're doing anything where rapid target engagement at varying ranges is going to be involved, I always suggest a first focal plane scope. Um, it's less to screw up, and that's basically what it comes down to. Um, Less things that can go wrong means less things that will go wrong. If you leave a hole in your plan, that's where things are going to go wrong at. Now, a second focal plane scope does have some advantages. If you're always shooting at known distances or you're always shooting on a static firing line and you want to get the finest aiming point possible, then a second focal plane scope is a better option. When you dial that scope power all the way up to its maximum, you still have a nice fine reticle. The reticle doesn't appear to get really fat when you dial it up. Uh, first focal plane scopes, even though the reticle is still the same, covering the same amount of target, it's distracting for some shooters when you crank it up and now the reticle appears to cover the whole aiming point you're trying to hit. So second focal plane scopes can have a finer reticle and get away with that because it stays the same. If you try to put a super fine reticle in a first focal plane scope, when you dial it down to three power, that reticle is going to disappear. So the reticle has to be a little bit thicker to be visible at lowest power, and then they have to balance it out to make sure it's not too thick at the highest power. I hope that didn't confuse you. If it did, please post some questions up below. We'll try to go into this a little bit greater detail with some actual shots through the scope at a later point. Um, I was pressing this to get this episode done quickly so I didn't have time to get out and mock the scopes up and actually run some video footage through them. But I promise we are going to do a first focal plane and second focal plane scope uh, episode just dealing with those because we get so many questions about them. Our next question is from Firebug Eater. Will rain or snow deflect bullets? Also, how does humidity and barometric pressure affect the trajectory of a bullet to what extent? I'm sure the answer is fairly case specific, but perhaps there is some general rule of thumb. Well, Firebug Eater, the easy answer to that question is no, there's no rule of thumb. Uh, I've never seen any formula or anything that will come down and cover all bullets at all velocities. Uh, basically, what is affecting the trajectory of the bullet is the density of the air it has to flow through, the ballistic coefficient of the bullet, and the speed with which it's leaving the gun. Um, you have to punch all those into a formula and come out and see what you're gonna get for your drop. Um, that's just way too much math for me. It's too many formulas. I much prefer either to use a tool like the FDAC, the Field Density Altitude Calculator, or something like a iPhone or Android program, either Ballistic FTE, uh, KC's Bullet Flight, Shooter, those are all good programs to use. If you don't have access to an Android or an iPhone, simply go online to JBM Ballistic Calculator and type all your variables in and print out a couple of sets of range cards for different conditions that you are likely to see. Um, I generally do that and keep them in my data book as a backup in case everything else goes down. That way I know even if I'm on the other side of the country, I can pull it out and I can get relatively close. I won't get the pinpoint accuracy that I would get with a real ballistic calculator, but sometimes close is good enough. As far as your rain or snow question, as long as you've compensated for all the other uh, variables, being the humidity, the temperature, the altitude, the barometric pressure, um, as long as you've compensated for all those other variables, then I've never seen rain or snow actually have an independent effect on the flight of the round. Um, I've heard guys say that they've witnessed bullets hit raindrops and blow apart and all that stuff. Um, I like to chalk that up to a lot of uh, gun shop talk. I've never actually seen it, and I've put a lot of rounds down range in the rain. Um, but I also tend to shoot heavier calibers. I'm not shooting really light varmint calibers. 
Um, I really would like to get some time and talk to an engineer and find out if there's something going on with the speed of the bullet and the shock wave that it creates actually pushing rain out of the way, or if it's possible that it's just vaporizing the rain as it goes through. I really don't know. I'm not bashful to tell you that. Uh, I'd much rather tell you I don't know than just kind of try to make up an answer for you. But in my experience, I haven't seen it to make a difference. On Sniper's Hide, A.K. Scott asks, how do you use a mill dot reticle in conjunction with MOA turrets? Well, Scott, that's actually been something I've been meaning to cover for a while. Uh, we kind of get bent out of shape a lot of times about suggesting mill mill scopes, and with good reason, uh, matching scopes or matching turrets and reticles uh, offer great advantage in speed and reduction in confusion. However, you can still get some of the advantages of a mill mill scope or an MOA MOA scope by actually knowing how to convert what you're seeing in the reticle into what you dial on the turrets. Now, one mill equals 3.47 MOA. Now, for what we're going to do here, and only for what we're going to do here, we're going to round to 3.5 MOA, so 3.5 MOA. So we're going to assume that for our calculations, one mil is 3.5 MOA. Now let's say you're out at the range and you've got your brand new rifle scope. Well, you bought the scope before you did all your research on the internet, and you've got the standard quarter MOA turrets with a mil reticle. It's been the standard for many, many years. I've still got a couple in the safe that are uh, MOA turrets and mil reticles. Well, we don't want to spend a whole lot of ammo zero and down range and we don't have a target that's got our grids marked out and we forgot our ruler. So what we're going to do is plop down behind our rifle and we're going to go ahead and fire a shot. Well, when we look down range, we did a pretty good job mounting our scope and we see that our shot is one mil right and one mil low. We're going to keep it even right now just to make things a little bit easier. Well, one mil right and one mil low tells me that I'm going to have to use my correction factor and I'm going to have to come up 3.5 MOA and I'm going to have to come left 3.5 MOA. We'll dial that into the turret, send another round, and see where we're at and make a slight adjustment off of that. Now, because we're rounding, you may not be absolutely perfect, especially if you've got to crank those turrets quite a bit. However, it's going to get you closer. And if you're shooting at an unknown distance, and you're shooting on something that you have no size reference to, then knowing that one mil equals 3.5 MOA is gonna allow you to dial and get a little bit closer than just trying to fudge it. So that's a quick and easy way to get the advantages of matching reticle and turret with a mismatch setup. Mid Kansas guy asks, when using an FFP MOA MOA scope, can you use the reticle to make changes to the scope and get an accurate shot, i.e. using a mil mil scope, and making the adjustment based on what you see off the reticle? I asked because I tried this on my MOA MOA scope and it didn't seem to work. It was about half the correction my reticle asked for. Well, yes, you should be able to measure your offset through the reticle and dial it on exactly on the turrets. If you're not able to do that, then what I highly suggest you do is get out and actually check the reticle to make sure what you're seeing is correct and get out and check the turrets and make sure what's on the turrets is correct. A real simple way to do that is to set your target board up at exactly 100 yards. Uh, either use a laser range finder or use a measuring tape and make sure that it's exactly 100 yards from the scope. Now, get your zero fire one shot, dial one or two MOA up on your scope, fire another shot, repeat and fire another shot. Do that all the way up until you reach the end of your target board or the limit of your scope's adjustment ability. Now, between each one MOA increment, you should have 1.047 inches downrange. Now, let's say you came up 10 MOA. Well, you should be able to measure from your center to that 10th MOA mark, and that should be 10.47 inches. If it's not 10.47 inches, you've got something else going on. 
Uh, you need to make sure you're shooting accurately when you're doing this and that you're keeping track of how far up you're coming. Now, the added advantage to this is if you go out and you draw a line on your target and you draw another line at 10.47, then when you line your reticle up on it, that should equate to 10 mils, or I'm sorry, 10 MOA in your reticle. If it doesn't, then there's something wrong with your reticle. Your reticle's off. So if you're not being, if you're not able to dial into the turrets what you see in the reticle and get the correct adjustment, you need to check both to make sure that they're correct. R. Futch asks, what are the differences in using match primers like Federal Gold Medal Match or using standard rifle primers like Winchester? Is there any gains to switching to the Federal Gold Medal Match? Really, I've used CCI primers and Federal Gold Medal Match primers. When I first started reloading, I was using CCI mainly because they were what was available locally to me without having to pay extra charges or extra hazmat shipping fees for primers. Um, however, a couple years back, I switched to Gold Medal Match because I found a local supplier for those and I buy them by the case. Uh, really, I prefer Gold Medal Match just for the peace of mind. The match primer should have higher quality control and they should have better consistency. I say should have because I haven't actually shot them side by side and tested them for the difference. The reason being mainly is because the cost difference isn't enough for me to worry about it. Um, I haven't done it mainly because I view my time as worth something and the cost difference just basically isn't worth my time. Uh, I know that's, that's kind of a uh, canned answer, um, but what I would suggest, because different loads are going to respond differently to different changes, that if you want to know if one primer is going to work better for you than another, just take them out and shoot them side by side. Um, load up, you know, 50 with your regular primer and 50 with the primer you're looking to change to. I will caution you on this though. If you are running on the ragged edges of pressure, if you like to run some hot loads, do not just switch out the primer. You may find that the primer you're switching to is hotter than the one you have and it may cause a little bit more pressure in your reloads. So if you're going to just switch primers and you're running on the ragged edge, like anything, bump it down 10% and work back up to where you're at. Uh, you don't want to just risk it and end up blowing up a gun or harming yourself. On Twitter, Ryan Ingid asks, what are your thoughts on lapping a stock Remington barrel using the Croil JB method? I'm getting a lot of copper fouling. Well, Ryan, generally I'm not a big fan of lapping barrels that have already been chambered and already been crowned. Uh, the reason being is you really run more risk of damaging it than you do of helping it. Um, don't worry about the copper fouling that you're seeing on a factory barrel. They tend to foul uh, pretty visibly. Uh, when you look down the muzzle, you can see copper streaks. Um, don't worry about cleaning until you get all that stuff out. It's really not a big deal. Um, when I clean a rifle, you know, I run a solvent soaked brush through the barrel, probably about 10 strokes, which is probably excessive for what I do. I clean about every 500 rounds, but I'll run the solvent soaked brush through. I'll run three solvent soaked patches through waiting between each patch. Then I'll run about three dry patches through and I'll be done. Um, there's really not a whole lot to it. Don't worry about getting that last bit of blue off of the uh, patches. Don't worry about if you've got that last patch and it comes out a little gray. Uh, don't start the cycle all over again. A lot of guys are trying to clean the barrel steel out of the barrel. Uh, it's just not necessary. If you've got a barrel that's really shooting like crap and it's really fouling badly, then the next step is going to be to rebarrel it with a custom barrel anyway. So at that point, if you want to try some different stuff on it, go right ahead. Um, you're probably not going to make it shoot any worse if it's a really bad barrel. What I would try first before you go to any uh, lapping compounds or stuff like that is run some uh, Tubbs Final Finish bullets through it. They're bullets that are covered with varying grades of lapping compound. They've got a one through five grade. Each uh, set has 10 bullets in it. 
Uh, I just finished loading up a set of those for a friend of mine here. Um, they, since when you're firing these through, you're firing different grades of compound and you're firing them only one direction through the bore, I think the, the possibility for damage is fairly minimal. They've done a whole lot of research on getting this kit set up. So I think that might be a good investment on a rifle that you're really having bad fouling problems on or you just can't get to shoot. And again, if that's the case, the next step afterward is replacing the barrel. So you really don't have anything to lose at that point. But for regular routine maintenance or to try to solve a fouling issue that you see that you're not really seeing on targets, I would stay away from putting anything abrasive in the bore. Cody Caldwell on Twitter asks, What aftermarket barrels would you recommend for a 308 Remington 700? Also, what trigger? Because I don't like my Xmark Pro. Well, Cody, you are not alone. There are a lot of people out there that don't like the Xmark Pro. It's really a hit or miss trigger. Sometimes you get a really good one. Sometimes you get one that just really does not want to hold adjustments. Um, if you are looking at replacing a trigger, definitely look at a Timney 510. Uh, the Timney 510 has all the safety benefits of the Remington Xmark Pro trigger. Uh, they come with a wider trigger and you can even get a straight trigger bow now if you like that kind of trigger. Um, they come with the replacement safety lever already on the trigger. Uh, a lot of triggers out there will utilize an old style Remington uh, safety mechanism. If they utilize the old safety mechanism, that's going to be a problem for you because the Xmark utilizes a totally different safety lever. So you need to find a trigger that comes with its own safety lever already on it. The Timney 510 takes care of that. Uh, it's a really good trigger. I've been pretty happy with ours. I, in fact, I haven't even touched the adjustments on it. I ordered it at three and a half pounds. That's how it came out. In fact, I think it came just a hair lighter than that, um, like 3.4 or something like that. Um, very good trigger. I'm very happy with it. In fact, we did a review on the 8541tactical.com website. Uh, you can go there and check it out. We'll put the link below and uh, see what we had to say about that. On your barrel question, what I would suggest you do is find a shop that you want to do the work and ask them what they suggest based on what you intend to do with the rifle. They should be able to listen to what you want this rifle to do and be able to recommend a barrel contour, a length, a twist rate, and a chamber based on what you're shooting. Use their expertise, you're already paying for it, so it only makes sense to listen to them. Additionally, there are so many high quality barrel manufacturers out there that it doesn't make a lot of sense to get your heart set on one brand of barrel, find out that barrel's back ordered, and there are half a dozen of a different brand sitting on your shop shelf just ready to go. So. Talk to who you want to do the work and find out what they recommend. Well, that's it for our questions for this week, but before we go, we want to let you know of some of the other things that we're going to have going on here. Um, we are wrapping up the review of the SWFA SS 5 to 20 power scope. Uh, we've been getting some trigger time on it here lately, took it to one local match, and it's performed really well. I've been pretty impressed with the scope. There are just a few points that uh, we want to cover on it, but overall, it's been a great scope for us. Uh, we just recently got an odd mount from Adland Engineering. Uh, this is an AR type uh, 30 millimeter mount with 20 minutes of angle built into it. It's a 1.45 inch height. Um, this mount has got some interesting features. Although it looks kind of like a quick release mount, there's no quick release. It's a regular Picatinny style mount with four screws on the side. And it's got three heavy duty recoil lugs underneath it. It's a really beefy mount, but it's a beefy built mount without a lot of extra weight to it. Uh, it's got a six ring front cap, four ring rear cap. Uh, but the really interesting feature on this is it's got a bubble level built in to the rear of the mount. So those of you guys that really like to have levels on your uh, optics, it's got the level built right in there, no extra piece to buy, nothing hanging out to the side to flip or to break. Uh, we'll be interested to see how this works out. We're going to put it on AR-15 and give it a run. Lastly, Dennis Adams in Virginia sent us this uh, nifty AI 
action wrench. Um, this is a, a really interesting piece because he's done a couple of different things that we haven't seen on AI action wrenches before. Um, this is kind of a prototype slash pre-production or uh, pre-production wrench. Uh, we're going to give it a try on our AE Mark II when we rebarrel to 243 Winchester. Um, we're going to check it against some other AIs out there to make sure it works across the platform, but it should work with short action and long action AIs, as well as short action and long action Badger 2008s. So it'll be a really interesting product. It looks to be extremely well made and well finished. And we'll keep you guys up on what's going on with it and where you can get one if they work out pretty well. Finally, we've got our budget precision project sitting here. Uh, I know some of you guys have been following it so far and I feel bad that I've let you down for a couple of months without an update on it. Uh, we will be installing a Surgeon Magazine system on it in the next installment. We hope to get that out in the next week or two. Um, it's going to be a fairly quick uh, video, but we're going to cover some points on installing the magazine system and some things you need to think about if you're planning a magazine system from the get-go. So look for that in the next couple of weeks. Well, that's it for this week's episode. Thank you for watching, and thanks for sticking with us so far. If you're a subscriber, thank you. If you're not a subscriber, please click the subscription button above. It's free, it doesn't cost you anything, and it helps our rankings on YouTube. Also, if you've liked the video, if you're a subscriber or not, please click the like button below. Clicking the like button raises our rankings, and it helps us show up better in the search results. If you dislike the video and you're tempted to click that little thumbs down button, please go below and type in the comments section what you disliked about the video. I'm more than happy to hear constructive criticism. If you think there's something we need to change, please let us know. We want to keep this thing going and we can't keep it going without viewers. So if there's something you'd like to see or something you'd like to see less of, please let me know. For you guys that aren't subscribers, click the subscription button above and help us out. Till next week, check out some of our other videos and send us your questions. We can't do this without your questions, so send us your questions in the comment section below or on Facebook or Twitter. We'll get to them, we'll pick the best ones, and we'll post them on next week's show. Thank you, and see you next Monday. Still watching? Video's over. You can go now. Now, well, since you're still here, click on one of the videos over here. Watch some of our other videos. No, I'm serious. This one's over. Nothing more to see here. Move along.